let me introduce our speaker for the morning. Please help me welcome Dr. Ashley Baker, Palomar Observatory. Dr. Baker, thank you for taking time to speak with us today. Dr. Baker serves as instrument scientist and research associate in astronomy with the Exoplanet Technology Laboratory at Caltech Optical Observatories, where among other projects, she is presently building a new instrument for the Hale Telescope named Hyrex. Dr. Baker earned her bachelor's degree in physics from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill <clears throat> in 2014 and completed her PhD in the physics and astronomy department at the University of Pennsylvania in May, 2020. Later that year, she came to Caltech as a 51 Pegasi B postdoctoral scholar. Her dissertation concerned the development and testing of a novel high throughput multiband photometer designed to achieve high levels of efficiency in the detection, excuse me, the detection of exoplanet atmospheres. Sounds like you've been working on Hyrex for quite a while, Dr. Baker. So right now, I'll ask everyone to turn their microphones off. You can type questions into the chat and we'll pick them up at the end. For now, Dr. Baker, I'm very glad you could join us today. Again, welcome to the Greenway Talks online. And please, with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. Let's see, there we go. All right. Can you see the, are you seeing the, um, no, I think I need to switch them. Ah, it's doing this thing where you're seeing the presenter view, right? Okay. Oh, it's good. Sorry. Let's just try that again. I think, uh, Steve, you're muted. If someone could unmute and let me know. Um, now now you're good. You're good. I'm good? You're okay. good. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, all right, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. It's really nice to be here um, to tell you about um, Hyrex. Um, so you can see the instrument here um, in this picture uh, being guided into the prime focus cage of the Hale Telescope at Palomar by uh, Kurt there on the right. And this instrument um, is uh, exploring a new way to study hot Jupiter atmospheres and exoplanet atmospheres in general. Um, and so, but before I go into the instrument, I would like to talk about um, some of the background on exoplanet atmospheres. So, and then I'll, after that, I'll talk about some of the motivation for this instrument and give you an, an overview. And then finally, I'll talk about the, um, progress and future work um, to be done for the project. All right, so um, first I wanna talk about what atmospheres um, actually tell us about um, these exoplanets. So I'm sure many of you are already familiar with what exoplanets are. They're planets orbiting other stars, um, stars other than the sun, and they're their atmospheres are a window into many interesting, um, many interesting properties about the planets, including the chemical makeup. So are the planets um, made up of things that their star is made up of? Um, this is also our way to try and measure things like oxygen in the planet if we ever wanna try to detect biosignatures, for example. Um, 
atmospheres also have clouds, as we know from our own um, uh, planet and also the other planets in the solar system. So we can probe those by looking at the atmosphere. We can also uh, measure the temperature and the pressure and also the atmospheric dynamics, such as um, is the atmosphere escaping? Are there winds? Um, what's the temperature circulation like? And these are all really interesting properties that uh, we can currently uh, probe today with today's instruments. Um, what, where it gets really interesting though, I think is when we can detect many, do this for many, many planets um, and start comparing planets to one another and also placing the solar system in context. Um, so when we do these measurements for lots of planets, um, we get to drop the planets again. We can um, start to answer questions like the ones that I've listed here, such as how unique is the solar system? Are there planets other than Earth that could support life? That one's a really interesting one. And also lots of other things like, you know, we could start looking at the, the planet's host star and try to learn about how um, that might relate to what we're seeing in the planet's atmosphere. Um, so in order to do these atmospheric studies, we need two things. We need a sample of planets and we need the instruments um, to actually go out and characterize the, the atmospheres. And so starting with the sample of planets, um, I'm sure a lot of you are also already familiar with the transit method. Um, this is a really good way that we've been able to really increase the sample size of planets that um, we have detected. So the planet passes in front of its star if it's in the right orientation. And as it does so, the brightness of the um, star dips um, because the planet's uh, area is blocking out some of the light. And the Kepler space mission and the TESS um, transiting exoplanet survey satellite have done a lot of work to detect a lot of planets. And you can see on the right here, we have over 5,000 planets confirmed. And this uh, histogram is showing the techniques that were used to um, detect the planets. And you can see that most of the line here, lines here are green, which means most of the planets we've detected are from transits, um, mostly thanks to Kepler and now TESS. So this is really useful for um, exoplanet atmospheric studies because transits, uh, when a planet is in an orientation such that it transits, we can also utilize this fact to study the atmosphere of the planet. And so um, the way that we do that um, is utilizing the fact that when the planet passes in front of its star, some of the light uh, will not only pass uh, get blocked by the planet, causing that dip in the light curve, but some of the light will also filter through the atmosphere of the planet. And so what you're seeing in this cartoon is light from the star on its way to an observer on Earth. Um, and some of that light, depending on its color and what molecules are in the atmosphere of the planet, will either be absorbed or scattered or maybe or just make it through the atmosphere. Um, and so this technique is called transmission spectroscopy. And it's the technique that the instrument I'll talk about, Hyrax, um, uses to, will use to do its measurements. And so what this ends up looking like in, ter in terms of the transit is that um, the, for example, if you're looking at the brightness of the star over time, now if you just look in blue light, the planet will look um, deeper than if there was no atmosphere at all, because the atmosphere is adding some radius to the planet, um, as it seems from an observer measuring the light curve. Um, the planet looks bigger in blue light, but in purple light, the planet will look similar or look much, um, not much, but smaller. Um, the actual effect is very small because atmospheres, uh, if you've ever seen a picture of Earth's atmosphere, um, it looks like a very thin layer of an onion. Um, it's, it's very small. The uh, 
uh, precision that Hyrax will be going for, uh, what it needs to achieve to actually detect uh, molecules in the atmospheres of hot Jupiters is on the parts per thousand level, which is like, uh, like a teaspoon in one to two gallons of water. But uh, for Earth-like planets in the future, uh, we'll need larger telescopes for this, but for measuring like oxygen in Earth-like atmosphere, you'll need something like um, a drop of water in like 10 gallons, so a part per billion. Um, level of precision. And so it's a really difficult measurement to make, um, which is why you need very sensitive instruments. So what does applying uh, transmission spectroscopy in practice actually look like? Um, so first you need an instrument um, that disperses or diffracts the light into a spectrum, or, uh, or you at least need something that allows you to observe the star um, as the planet transits in different colors. And then once you do that, you can then generate these light curves, one for each of the colors that you observed in. And then from those transits, you can then extract the size of the planet because the depth of the transit tells you about the area blocked out, which tells you about the size of the planet. You can plot the size of the planet as a function of wavelength. So uh, that's kind of, that's what's being shown here in this example spectrum, real spectrum of um, a planet, of a hot Jupiter planet, um, where there's sodium, strong sodium in the, the atmosphere. And so the y-axis here is really, is literally just the planet to star radius ratio as a function of, and then that's a, a plot as a function of wavelength. Um, and then once you have your spectrum, you can then fit it with models to constrain the abundance. You can constrain the pressure um, and temperature of the atmosphere as well. Um, and that's what these blue lines here are going through the, um, the black data points is. So I'm here to talk about a new instrument to do this. So I'm gonna focus on um, the instrument part of this. So I wanna give you an idea of um, what instruments we actually currently use to do this. So the main instrument is the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, this is really the workhorse for doing these transmission spectroscopy studies. And it's so good because it's in space. You don't have to deal with Earth's atmosphere, uh, which absorbs uh, water vapor and uh, overlaps a lot of the interesting features that we're interested in looking at. Um, so Hubble is, doesn't have an infinite lifetime, unfortunately. Um, so eventually we will lose that. And when we do, we will lose visible light coverage from space. Um, and there is another mission that's planned. Um, if it's called Louvoir, uh, it won't launch until 2039 if it's funded. Um, so there'll be a huge gap where we don't have this visible coverage. And uh, oxygen, um, so I say no oxygen detection possible until LeVar. So oxygen, the best um, wavelengths to look for that if we, again, for this interesting application of looking for biosignatures in exoplanet, in Earth-like exoplanet atmospheres in the future, um, like we won't be able to do that until a um, uh, space instrument like LeVar. Um, and the large reason for that is not just because we don't have visible light coverage, but also because Hubble and even James Webb um, does not have the aperture size um, large enough to do that detection. Um, but it's something that we should be thinking about for the future, um, since looking for biosignatures is a large goal of the um, exoplanet field um, to work towards. And Additionally, any other cool science um, in the optical, you know, we'll have to do from the ground. Um, so this is not only because we might lose Hubble um, at some point soon, but also just because Hubble is a pretty busy telescope. So essentially it's good, it would be good to have the ability to, to do more from the ground in the optical, especially in this um, field of explant transmission spectroscopy. And so there are instruments from the ground that do this currently. Um, 
the two, so I'm only going to talk about low resolution instrument options, although Steve did uh, ask me about the Keck Planet Finder earlier, which is a high resolution spectrograph um, that can also do uh, similar measurements, uh, but it the way that high resolution instruments work and the measurements that they can do is a little different and actually they're, they complement low resolution techniques. So I'm just gonna focus on low resolution because that's what Hyrax is and it, it's kind of filling this, um, this niche space, uh, parameter space of um, the types of transmission spectroscopy measurements we can do. So the two ways to do this instrument wise are one um, using a filter where you just filter out the light. So light from the telescope uh, you collimate it and pass it through a filter and you get light your star image um, in the one color that you desire. Or on the right, you can disperse or diffract the light, um, send it through a prism or a grating, and then you can get a, a spectrum where you have that, your image of a star, but overall that your wavelengths at one time kind of overlapping. And there are pros and cons of each of these ways. So in the filter-based way, it's, it's kind of nice because you don't have to question what your wavelength solution is. You know what wavelength you're observing in. Um, also, if you have bad seeing, so remember we're thinking about doing this from the ground, um, where you, now we have to deal with Earth's atmosphere. If you have poor seeing or um, your optics aren't, uh, you know, you have to have some specifications on your optics to get good image quality potentially. So you're kind of insensitive to that because um, if your star image of your star blurs, you can still just sum up all the light. And at the end of the day, you want uh, to get a precise light curve um, to measure that star, that planet uh, radius. But on the right side, um, on the dispersion-based method, if your image quality changes, then that'll change the resolution because now your uh, bunch of images of your star, different wavelengths are now blurring together. You also um, are gonna be using a monochrome camera uh, detector. And so the uh, it's a little arbitrary what your wavelength solution is. You have to solve for that. Um, and, but one thing, uh, the reason why the dispersion based method is more used is because um, typically astr astronomical filters are really, really wide. Um, and that's not super helpful for detecting molecular or atomic features in the spectra of atmosphere or of exoplanet atmospheres because the features are so narrow. So you need higher resolutions. Um, and another benefit of the dispersion base is that you get lots of wavelengths at the same time. Whereas in the filter base, you're kind of wasting time having to switch filters to get a different uh, color. So the idea for Hyrax um, is to kind of try to combine the benefits of both of these methods uh, by using different types of filters. So not broadband filters, but using um, really narrow band filters. So Hyrax will explore this narrow band filter based instrument. Um, and also another goal of Hyrax is to really design this instrument such that it's optimized for studying exoplanet atmospheres. A lot of the other instruments that are, that are currently being used to study exoplanet atmospheres are existing ones that were not designed with exoplanet atmospheres in mind. Uh, but Hyrax will be designed with x y atmospheres in mind. So these narrowband filters, so, in, so now instead of just passing the light from the star through one filter um, and getting a broadband, uh, broadband pass, you take the light from that's reflected, uh, that doesn't get through your filter, it reflects off your filter, and then you can send it through and pass it through filter number two here and get a second image of your star. So this is kind of the way that Hyrax works to get multiple images of a star through different colors at the same time. So now that you have, you have a little bit more wavelength coverage than if you're just using one filter. Also, these filters are very special um, in that they can achieve higher resolutions. So they can achieve band passes as narrow as three angstroms over a wide uh, wavelength range. 
So in that way, you can get your higher resolution as well. But you're still imaging, so you're still insensitive to image quality, um, and you know what your wavelengths are. So just to point out that there are some instruments that have used narrowband filters before. Um, one of these is uh, on work, which the wide field infrared camera, which is one of the instruments actually at Palomar. Um, so I think it's pretty cool that um, this has already been done at Palomar um, in a more a simpler sense. So this image here is showing work before many additions were made to it that made it much less slim today. But inside of work, there's a filter wheel and in this filter wheel, a, a narrowband filter was installed that overlaps the helium transition at 1,083 um, nanometers. So on the right here, you're seeing this, uh, a transit uh, in gray and the black points are just bend of the helium in uh, the exoplanet targeted by Vista Pergata at all 2020. Um, so the blue curve is a white light curve, so not um, kind of average out over many different wavelengths. That just shows the kind of average radius of the planet. So you can see that in the helium line and through this filter that just focuses on helium, that it's much deeper and you can, which implies that there's a lot of helium um, absorption happening in this planet's atmosphere. And this is kind of, this is really interesting because helium informs us of atmospheric escape. Uh, so this is a really cool science application of these filters. Uh, but what makes Hyrex unique and kind of a uh, step up is that uh, in all the other applications of narrowband filters, they only had one filter. They didn't have a reference band. This blue light curve um, was from a different instrument, a different time that they pulled to do this comparison. But Hyrex will have the ability to take um, multiple do multiple transits in multiple bands at the same time. And so here's the optical design of Hyrax. I'll just walk through it uh, quickly. So light from the telescope um, comes in. These are the narrow band filters now. And you pass light through one, and then that light uh, filters out a narrow band, which for Hyrax, we optimize these band passes to overlap the sodium feature, which I'll talk more about uh, in upcoming slides. Uh, and then any light that gets that doesn't pass through gets reflected back to another filter uh, that takes out a little bit of light uh, adjacent to that original band pass. And then this happens one more time. And in theory, you could trail uh, several more of these uh, filters but for now, we're just starting with three to test the concept. Um, and then this final beam that passes off the last filter actually goes to a little pocket spectrometer that measures Earth's atmospheric absorption so that we can make sure that we're understanding what the Earth's atmosphere is doing at the same time in terms of water vapor absorption. And then at the top here, there's a guide arm for making sure that we're guiding on the, on the star. So the HIREX stands for the High Efficiency Instrument for the Rapid Assessment of Exoatmospheres. So um, that acronym kind of came from the idea uh, that this, because we're in imaging mode, uh, we'll be able to achieve um, photometric, the photometric precisions closer to the photon noise and be less impacted by uh, systematics that commonly affect spectrographs. Um, and of course, we're going after exoplanet atmospheres. So the final image of that Hyrex produces is shown in this bottom right um, blue figure here. And this is just a simulation. Uh, but the final image is just three stars, copies of three stars that overlap the sodium signal um, and kind of sample the sodium feature. So Hyrax is going to be installed at prime focus. That way there's only one optic between Hyrax um, and light from 
uh, a distant star. So we really wanted to increase the throughput of the instrument as much as possible so that we're not throwing away any photons because it is a very uh, difficult measurement to make and we need all the photons we can get. So this, I don't know how many of you have visited Palomar, I'm sure quite a few, but um, this project was kind of my first trip out to Palomar and it was just super cool going up this uh, elevator to prime focus. And so that's where uh, Greg and I are standing here on this, on this elevator and Kurt is in the prime focus cage there um, with the hard hat on and Hyrax gets craned up and installed at prime focus. And um, so I'll talk more about the installation process in a bit, but first I wanna answer why sodium. Um, so I talked quite a bit about oxygen before, actually when we first started, my, my PhD advisor and I first started thinking about this instrument, we were thinking about it in the context of oxygen in future space missions that um, really, you know, it's really hard to send a big aperture um, telescope into space. Even James Webb is six and a half, but we need something more like 15 to 20 meter telescope in space to be able to detect oxygen in an Earth-like atmosphere. And so we really wanted to think about a very efficient instrument for detecting oxygen, but we don't have any large telescopes now. Um, and so testing this instrument it made, for testing this instrument it made sense to start with sodium, uh, which is very common in hot Jupiter atmospheres, and we don't have to achieve as high of precision or be in as large as a telescope to, to do very interesting science uh, with Hyrax. So this, we saw a sodium spectrum before, but I'll explain uh, why it has this shape here. So, this cartoon is showing uh, sodium absorption uh, as a function of wavelength. But before we found out that absorption is just like the radius or the size of the planet. So if we think about the bottom here as being the planet surface, then you can think about up on this plot as the altitude above the planet that we're looking at. So in the middle here, uh, where sodium, the sodium absorption is the strongest, we're at high up in the alt altitude uh, or in above the planet surface. And, um, but as you get further away um, from that main absorption wavelength that sodium absorbs at, you still see absorption because at lower uh, altitudes, the pressure of the planet is much higher. So you get pressure broadening effects that uh, cause sodium to absorb a little bit further away from its main resident resonance. And so uh, you get this characteristic Lorentz profile um, that you see here uh, it for the sodium signature in an exoplanet atmosphere. And so that in the shape of the sodium feature, you can tell about the pressure in the atmosphere. On, in the right half of this panel, there's a cloud deck um, at a certain altitude. But yeah, so once you're far away enough, um, if you have a cloud deck, then if you're in a regime where sodium is not above the cloud deck, absorbing above the cloud deck, then your the size of your planet will be constituted by the size, like the height of this cloud deck. In this way, you can also learn about the the clouds in an atmosphere if you if you see a feature that looks more like the panel on the right. And so, what Hyraxes do um, with its three bands is tile these bands around the center of the sodium feature so that it's sampling this line. And you can see how it'd be good to have more bands so that you can sample more of this, of this feature. Um, but for now, it will start with, we'll start with these three bands and we'll get an image like on the right here where you get image of your star and then you can measure the transit in these three different colors. So a little bit more about the Hyrax project timeline. So we were actually funded just a little over a year ago um, in 2021 um, by the Keck Institute for Space Sciences. And we're just a small team uh, from Caltech and JPL uh, that there's a few people missing on this picture of the right, on the right from our first trip to Palomar, but that's the majority of the team. Um, 
And I've been working a lot on the design uh, and the assembly and also um, planning for this first light testing that just happened, uh, I guess, a couple months ago now in July. And uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about these couple trips that we recently made to Palomar to for the first tests of the instrument. Um, and ho I'm hoping that the next time we go out to Palomar, it'll be the last time that the instrument has to transport back and forth between Caltech and Palomar. And we'll actually be observing hot Jupiters and starting a sodium survey. So in this first trip, yeah, so we had to pack up the instrument and drive it in a U-Haul to Palomar, which uh, was an interesting procedure because I got a, quite a small van. So it was, the clearance was a little difficult, but when we got to Palomar, um, the staff is incredibly helpful and very excellent at uh, forklift handling. And so they're able to get it out, no problem. So. I thought, I think it's just so interesting how the instruments have to be transported up to prime focus. So a lot of the first test, um, this was, uh, I think in June, we went out for the fit check. A lot of the test was just making sure that we could crane the instrument up without a problem. Um, and also that the instrument fit at the prime focus cage. So here is a view as a, we're riding up the elevator and the Hyrax is being transported up to be installed on the prime focus cage, which is in the middle there. Um, it's going quite slowly so that nothing extreme happens. And the um, main bulk of the instrument is this enclosure in the enclosure here and you can see the mechanical drawing on the right um, light from the telescope comes up from the pedestal and a lot of the fit check was making sure that this adapter plate which uh, is installed on hyrax actually fit the pedestal which it did um, and again this is kurt here guiding Hyrax onto the, the prime cage. So when we first put the telescope, the instrument on the telescope there, the telescope was being serviced. Um, so it couldn't move at all. So, but, so we were able to open the dome, but we weren't able to move the telescope. So we actually got light, but as you can imagine, we weren't guiding. So that we just saw streaks of stars and we also weren't focused. Um, but one of the tests of this, was to make sure that we're uh, within a range of focus such that it can be compensated by the pedestal movement. And so it was an interesting procedure, um, waiting for a star to pass overhead <laughs> a bright, that was bright enough when it was out of focus to, uh, to do this, this focus, um, these focus steps. But we were able to confirm that we were in range. So the second trip was actually an observing night. So the telescope was able to move again, um, we were able to track. So it was a, mostly a test of the electronics and the guiding software. Uh, so from the prime focus cage to the computer room, you can't run USB uh, because the path is too long. So you have to run fibers. And we were able to use the brand new OM4 fiber runs at Palomar. But uh, there was some question on um, how exactly do that and which ports um, were working. So we were able to test that all out um, since we were the first ones and, and connect to our electronics. And another thing about Hyrax with these filters is that the angle through the, the wavelength that you get through the filter depends on the angle of incidence of the light passing through the filter. So because of this, Hyrax is quite sensitive to the guiding stability. So a large test that we did was to make sure that uh, we could guide on a star uh, to the uh, precision that we needed. So a lot of the night um, was uh, pretty boring, mostly just guiding on a star and, and checking. 
uh, taking a bunch of data so that it could propagate that to uh, wavelength changes that we would expect due to guiding errors. So this is kind of where we left off. Um, we didn't have any more observing nights for the last uh, run and, and there's a lot of work to be done in terms of the alignment, the final alignment of the rest of the optics. Um, also, some of the uh, lenses arrived actually after this observing run. So we we're using uh, different lenses for, uh, for this test. So the next time that we go out, um, we will be fully aligned and ready to observe um, hot Jupiters. So that'll be the plan, hopefully at the start of uh, next year. So um, in summary, uh, we're exploring new techniques for studying exoplanet atmospheres uh, using multiple narrowband filters to measure the sodium of hot Jupiter transits. And so Hyrax is currently back in the lab at Caltech for final tests and alignment, but we hope to return soon. So there's a picture of me with Hyrax without its enclosure on in the lab ready um, for some more tests. And I just want to say a big thank you um, to you all for listening, but also to the staff at Palomar. Um, they're just so incredibly helpful. <laughs> it's such a treat to, to go there and um, work with such a large telescope. Um, yeah, with such great support. So thanks for listening and yeah, I hope to answer questions. Dr. Baker, thank you very much. Wonderful presentation. Let me ask if <clears throat> people will unmute themselves, open their microphones back up, and we're open for questions. Steve? This was a very interesting talk, uh, by the way. Uh, you, you presented the science very well and very clearly, but it, it's really fascinating to hear about you know, bringing experimental equipment and how that works. And I really liked your videos uh, uh, of uh, when you're taking uh, on, on a given run for an exoplanet atmosphere, do you stay tracking on the transit event for the entire duration? And you have to guide that accurately throughout. Yes, so that's one of the reasons why we have to um think about guiding um, is that we have to track for a duration of about four to five hours, because in addition to the transit, you also want to observe it before and after transit so that you have a baseline um, for fitting the depth. And so, yeah, so you have to track the whole time. So, um, as I understand it, I don't know, can I be heard here? Am I, am yeah, I, I can hear you. Um, you're using sodium because there's a lot of it around. Mm -hmm. um, if you use something that might be more indicative of a of a biosignature, um, mm -hmm. that might be what oxygen or methane. How much yeah. longer a run would you have to have to do those? That's a great question. I actually have. I think I put a slide in somewhere but it's hidden. Um, let's see. Okay, I lost my other slide, but um, so for, I actually did a study of this with a similar instrument with a slightly wider band pass um, as part of my PhD when we were interested in actually answering that exact question is how long do we have to observe to actually detect oxygen um, in an exoplanet atmosphere for like an Earth-like planet. So you don't expect to see oxygen in a uh, hot Jupiter. Um, but the answer is that you need a 15 meter aperture telescope and like at least and something like 20 transits. So on that order, um, it depends on how far the star is from you, um, how, you know, how, assuming Earth-like values for how much oxygen is, the exo, is in the exoplanet atmosphere um, and how what the spectral type of the star is, so which also determines how bright it'll be. But 
um, 20 transits, you know, five, well, the transit duration will be a little bit different for an Earth around a sun-like star, um, but that's that's actually an Earth around a M dwarf, which is easier to do. Um, so something like 60 hours to 100 hours of observing time would be needed to detect something like oxygen in an Earth-like atmosphere with a larger telescope than we have currently. <laughs> Steve Miller, Steve, you had you had a question about atmospheric loss. Do you want to uh, do you want to ask it now? Yeah, in uh, your talk, Dr. Baker, you mentioned uh, that helium was an indicator, or perhaps the loss of helium was an indicator of atmospheric loss. Could you explain that a little more? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it's not my uh, main research topic. So, but um, helium, it's a forbidden transition line. And I believe it's the, the um, high energy radiation from a star when the plant's very close typically um, can excite that line. And so that um, radiation um, is also re responsible for the escape of um, the, you know, for helium escaping from the atmosphere. And uh, there's a lot of good work, uh, not only by Shreya Specificata, but also Jessica Spake um, and several others um, on this topic. But you, another interesting thing when people are observing helium is that sometimes you see a tail in the signature. So you, the planet might be transiting and it, the transit's asymmetric, which points to the fact that there's a trailing uh, tail on the, on the planet uh, where the helium absorption is happening. And so that trailing atmosphere is also uh, escaping. So um, yeah, I can, I'm happy to point you to more uh, works that describe the, the physics more. That's kind of my understanding. Thank you. Yep. John Downing, you had you had a question about tracking the uh, tracking this process. Would would you want to ask it? Yes. Um, I'm just wondering if is it possible for us to keep track of your progress? That the science is very interesting. Just wondering if we might have a way to track the progress of your study. Yeah. So um, so I plan to present in a couple of years at SPIE on this project, but that's a couple of years away. Um, I'm not sure if the observing schedule is public, but you can see when we'll be on sky. Um, if, if it is, you can see when we'll be on sky at Palomar, um, in which case um, you're welcome to, to email me for updates, but I don't have a blog, um, so, or any way really to, um, publicly share the information in the meantime, but you're welcome to reach out anytime and I'm happy to, to update you. And the the observing schedule is public. Oh, cool. um, I'll 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 send around a link link to the observing schedule at some point here. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, and Tom, Tom Munkey, Munkey, if I get that right, uh, asked a question in the chat that I was wondering about. Um, it's about the efficiency of the mirror system. Uh, my, my sense was certainly looks like you lose, gonna lose an awful lot of light as you go from the first to the second to the third yeah. of the mirrors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's definitely a trade-off, especially if you're trying to add more um, filters in the future. But uh, because we're looking at such a narrow band pass, it's actually not hard to um, optimize the reflectivity of the mirrors in, in that space, um, especially if we went with custom coding. So Currently, we're just using off-the-shelf optics, and luckily, sodium's in a region of space that 
it kind of aligns with where most uh, optical coding uh, are very um, efficient as in addition to the detector quantum efficiency. So a lot of you know, CCDs will peak around that 600 nanometer uh, wavelength. So in that sense, we're, uh, our final throughput is actually higher or on par, not higher than most um, spectrographs that disperse light or diffract light. And um, we're like hitting around 60% right now. And a, a lot of that could actually be improved if we were to get custom coatings where we could really now uh, hone in, hone down on the wavelength range that we're at, which is so narrow that we could increase it further. Um, yeah. When you say 60%, 60% of what? Oh yeah, total light from uh, top of telescope to uh, detector inclusive. So are you saying that the filter, the, re the transmissivity of the filter for the non-narrow band, outside of the narrow band that you're detecting, are you saying that is a uh, much higher reflectivity than other filters? Yes, so, um, so yeah, two things. The 60% was the whole instrument. The filters themselves, the light that goes through, we're at around 90 to 95%. So they're very efficient in the filters themselves. And then the light that gets reflected off the filter is basically one minus um, the light that uh, went through. So we're very efficient in terms of the reflection off the filters. And then the other mirrors in the system, which are off the shelf mirrors, have custom have uh, off the shelf coatings as well. And those, the coatings could, if we were to custom make those, um, custom do the coatings could be improved even further. So looking at your optical path, it, the light comes from the telescope into the first filter, then it reflects to a mirror that reflects to the second filter. Is there any reason why you put the second filter where the reflector is so you don't have the mm. intermediary mirrors? So like you're saying like this filter, yeah. like put the filter there, or sorry, yeah. this mirror, put the filter there. In the middle there. Yeah, so it was mostly for space and um, these angles are kind of small and this image isn't showing the mounts. And so uh, you also want to minimize the length of the, the beam in your system because as the light is traveling, the angles from the different um, Feel, the different field angles will be diverging in the collimated beam. And so you wanna minimize that, this path length. So folding it seemed like the best way to do that and keep it compact and, um, and make sure that the mounts didn't collide. I didn't spend the longest time optimizing this layout though. So it's possible that putting the filter here could, could work out. But when I tried it, it kind of didn't work with space constraints. and. Um, yeah. And do you need one tech detector or couldn't you just have a small detector behind each uh, filter and not try to put the path down to a single detector? Yeah, so that's also a good question. Um, we wanted one detector for cost purposes um, and also such, so that the gain of in any systematics kind of are common to all of the images that the uh, since, uh, and also the timing is um, consistent between them, um, the exposure times. But uh, you could put, you could experiment with putting different um, detectors and see how that impacts the photometric precision. But for that, the concern of uh, uncommon systematics between the detectors and cost, we chose a single one. Okay, yeah. thank you. I suspect that if you had multiple detectors um, configuring them so that they gave the same output would be a nightmare and would occupy a tremendous amount of setup time. And you're much, much better off, I think, uh, from an old yeah, experimental physicist. Uh, you're much better off with one detector if you can do it that way at all. And this is, a, I think, a better solution than multiple detectors. 
Yeah, and you don't lose too much light with the, the mirrors. So it would also simple, there's, it is getting tight at the space. And so I could imagine if like a couple more filters get added, you might have to go into the third dimension here or uh, perhaps use the second detector. Um, but yeah, lots of, it's because it's all reflections, there's a lot to play with. Well, Steve Flanders, I have a question for you. For me? Yes. I'm curious, how many, how many different projects get 60 to 100 hours of observing time <laughs> on the Hale Telescope? Do you know? It would, need, it would need even more for, um, for the size of the Hale Telescope. <laughs> It'd be a lot. This is the problem with detecting oxygen. I think it's why we need to put a big aperture in space. <laughs> Start lobbying your Congress people <laughs> for this project. Well, I was going to follow up on the aperture question for oxygen detection. Is would this be part of the science case for these extremely large telescopes? And is there a path to do that? to get to one of them when they're built. Yeah, to put like this instrument on a large telescope. Large, like like the 30 meters that ever gets built yeah. somewhere or the, the ESOs big telescope mm -hmm. too. Yeah, so I think in this project, we're really trying to test this concept. So if it <clears throat> is successful, I think could definitely propose to put it on a larger telescope. Um, the, problem so we wouldn't be able to do oxygen from the ground because of earth's oxygen sure um so you would want to go to space for that but another thought for this instrument was maybe it's a good option for a space mission especially one that's dedicated to doing this detection this um measurement uh it's a little it lacks a little bit of versatility in terms of you know you pick your filters for one uh feature, one spectral feature. Um, but the filters can easily be just like swapped out. So there could be, you know, that versatility could be added back. Um, but definitely hoping that, you know, we get a lot of good science out of this and kind of show that it's a, it's a good concept for that could potentially be adopted in the future for other uh, observatories. Catherine, hi, you had your hand raised. Would you like to yes. ask a question? Catherine? Yes, I, I wanted to ask Ashley, how do you decide where to look on a, on a given night? Which star, which exoplanet you want to view on a given night? Yeah, so I think I, is it this plot? So um, a lot of work went into simulating the results of Hyrax. So, um, so this plot is showing all the stars that are accessible from Palomar that uh, further is showing their magnitude as a function of the expected signal that you would get for the differential transit. So the, the transit depth between one wavelength band on the sodium feature versus the ones that are off the sodium feature. So you can estimate um, the transit signal uh, for all the different known exoplanets that are accessible. And uh, so for 5.1 meter telescopes for the HALE, um, and just one transit, this line here is showing the, where you would get a signal and noise of about three. Um, so where you would get a detection. And everything to the right of that line is our planets that would be detectable. And so depending on the season that we're observing um, and choosing from these targets, we might propose for um, one of the easier ones just to start. Yeah. Um, and then in the future, once we to kind of get our handle on things um, and the data reduction and everything, then propose for some of the harder targets in here that or even further that might require a couple transits. And our first target will probably be one that has like a good sodium detection already so that we can compare um, our results to those results and just confirm that we understand everything. So we'll probably do that. Thanks. 
Yeah. Other questions, other questions? Anybody? Well, can I, can I return to something we talked about um, kind of at the beginning? You're also working on the uh, Keck Planet Finder. Mm. Yes. Can you, could, could you do a, a compare and contrast and tell us at least a little bit about the Keck Planet Finder? Yeah, definitely. Um, I might even be able to pull up some slides really quickly. So the Keck Planet Finder uh, is an instrument going on the Keck One telescope. Um, so I was telling some of the audience who are here early that I just got back from Hawaii. Um, a lot of the team is going out there because we're starting to install things, um, which is really exciting. But the Keck Planet Finder is a high resolution spectrograph for uh, doing radial velocity studies. Um, so here's a different presentation where I talk a little bit more about the Keck Planet Finder. Here, this is a good slide. Um, so it's much bigger than Hyrax. That's one contrast. So it's on a 10 meter telescope and the resolution of KPF is about 95,000. So with that resolution and the size of the aperture, um, this uh, instrument, KPF, is I think about two meters wide. Um, it's, it's quite large, um, or maybe between one and two meters. And uh, it has coverage from uh, 450-ish nanometers to 870 nanometers. So this is the throughput of KPF. So when you go to high resolution, you end, especially for a stabilized spectrograph like KPF, you end up having to throw out a lot of light. Um, these are fiber coupled. Um, so light from the telescope is injected into a fiber that runs into the basement of Keck um, that feeds the Keck instrument. Also a shell gratings are not the, you know, they have limited efficiency. And so the final throughput of KPF is about 7%, whereas Hyrax it's uh, 60%. Um, but the trade-off is that you get really high resolution. And with that, you can very closely track the stellar lines and watch the Doppler uh, effect uh, due to the planet's mass, tug on the line, the star and shift the lines back and forth. And that's how um, it will do the, um, radial velocity technique to measure the mass of the, its planets that it observes. How long are runs like that, do I think? Um, how, how like the exposure times needed? Yeah. Yeah, so for, it'll be mostly looking at bright stars. Um, and so the exposure times will be in the, on the minutes level. Um, for fainter targets, uh, maybe you'll take a couple 15 minute exposures, mm -hmm. but then you have to go back to the star over time to sample the different um, stellar line positions to actually then be able to plot the stellar velocity as a function of time to look for any uh, planetary signals. So you'll probably want at least like 20 to 30 visits. So, but you're looking at basically something that could be done in, in one night and doesn't require multiple nights. Yeah, so for RV science, for radial velocity science, you would have to look at it multiple nights for the final measurements. But each exposure is just a quick few minute exposure. <clears throat> hmm. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, are there, before we close, are there any other questions? Let me, let me open it. Let me keep it open for just a minute. Anybody, anybody got a question they want to ask? Well, with that, Dr. Ashley Baker, thank you very much. Um, Michael, in the, in the comments, in the, in the, or in the chat, excuse me, said, 
how fascinating the pictures you show, the videos you showed of Palomar, the trips to Palomar. And thank you very much for that. I thought I thought that was that was a great presentation. Great presentation. And also thank you for talking about some of the work work you're doing at CAC. Well with Thanks that. Thanks for having me. Well, and we appreciate it. Let me let me just conclude with a note about our next presentation. Uh, we are going to skip the Labor Day weekend. There will be no no Greenway talk on September third. So we're gonna we're gonna have go three weeks out. The Greenway talks online will continue on Saturday, September tenth, three weeks from now when we will be joined by Dr. Greg Hallinan, Caltech Professor of Astronomy and Director of Caltech's Owens Valley Radio Observatory. Dr. Hallinan is presently working on plans for the Deep Synoptic Array, a survey instrument that will be, in his words, the largest radio telescope ever built. DSA 2000, as it is called, will span 285 square kilometers in the Nevada desert and link together 2,000 five meter radio dishes. Dr. Hallinan has argued that this telescope will do for radio astronomy what the great survey telescopes of the present decade are doing for optical astronomy. So with that, thank you again to Dr. Ashley Baker and my thanks to everybody for attending, for being here and supporting the Greenway Talks online. With that, I'll close the session, say goodbye. Say and hey, that's it, say goodbye. And I look forward to seeing you again on Saturday, September 10th. Thank you and goodbye.